Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Julius. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I would like to give you a, an update on your society. As president, I am uh, sort of the chief officer of this organization for a year, and my year comes to a close on Thursday of this week. All right. Most of you have seen this before. It's our core mission. It's what we do. And I could just go into all the great things we're doing, which I will do in a minute. But before that, you know, the elephant in the room, Julius has already mentioned it, you'll hear it today in the, in the panel discussion, I'm sure, is that we've got a downdraft, you might say, that we find ourselves in a very difficult business environment. Here's a particular clipping from a Bloomberg article. Um, 200,000 jobs lost in the last 14 months. We've all seen articles like this or similar. The numbers change a bit. But I was trying to think how I could quantify this a little bit to show just what this situation really looks like. You know, in 2008, we had a, the Great Recession. Oil price dropped similar to values we have now, but we had the shale gas boom. We almost didn't notice it. 2012, we have a gas uh, commodity price drop, but we had the oil shale boom. So we didn't notice that, really, as an industry so much. But now we've got everything sort of stacked up against us. So here's the way I tried to quantify that. So this graph, and this is, I think, the only, uh, the only difficult graph I've got in here, so just bear with me. We've got three quantities on here. The blue line, North American reg count. The red line, North American gas. Spot price. The green line is oil. Uh, this time it's based on West Texas Intermediate, but it could be Brent. And on the vertical axis is a 12-month percentage change. So trailing 12-month percentage change. You can see that every one of these uh, indicators is down between 40 and 60 percent. The rig count this week went down eight more, so I couldn't even work that in. So what we've got here is a downdraft in all aspects of our petroleum business. And this impacts everything we do, from meetings to publications to short courses, across the board. You'll notice we've got on here the annual meeting from Denver, and here we are more or less today. We had a meeting right here at the end of that meeting, at the end of the Denver annual meeting. That's when I became president, and we immediately had a discussion with staff, senior staff, and we started an exercise of budget uh, contraction scenarios, 5%, 10%, 20%. Those scenarios were run out over the next few months, and many decisions were made based on those results. We had staff positions that were not filled and are still not filled. We're down something like 7% on staff by choice because we are responding to this environment. So that's the bad news. There's some good news. Happy birthday. Okay, 85 years of the SEG. The SEG was born in a depression, 1930. It would be six years before the world even started to recover. We built our first building in Tulsa. We opened it in 1985, which is the only good analogy for what we're going through right now, 1985, six, seven, which many in this room remember as a time that reset our society and our industry. Uh, and we still feel that today, as you'll see in our demographics curve, for example. But I do want to go through some of the things that we are doing. Uh, we're doing everything proactively because we still have an obligation to do what it takes to serve our membership, and the membership includes individuals, it includes corporate members, and I want to talk a little bit about the things we're doing along those lines. First of all, we have a global membership. Here's the number. If you want to know how many members there are of the SEG, uh, as you can imagine, this fluctuates week to week, month to month, all that. But the official count that we have is 32,843. And that number will be the number until next June when we get another consensus number. We're in 125 countries, 52 sections, almost 350 student sections around the world. We have on our board uh, Gustavo Carstens, who constantly challenges us to think globally. If we say we got a spring meeting, he goes, spring, which hemisphere? 
So we have to, we have to think differently as we become a more global society. If you look at the um, membership by region, here we see 45% in North America, and this North America is defined as US and Canada. And 65% of our membership is outside of that traditional region for the SEG. As your president, I have made many trips this year. I've visited most sectors of the world, and here I am in Tokyo. Uh, you can see I've got a, a red dot here, sort of indicates me. Here I am in the Asian pie sector. If you want to know what it's like to be a president, here you go. This is my travel calendar for 2015. <clears throat> we sit right at the end of, uh, well, we're right in here, right there. And you'll notice uh, the, less, the rest of my year, I get to actually do my job, go back to work every day at the University of Arkansas, which will be a pleasure. But it's also been a pleasure serving you, particularly in a downtime. This, this job, anybody could do this job at $120 oil. To do it now, and on John Bradford's watch, who's coming up behind me, is a challenge. And we certainly appreciate you entrusting the society to us in these difficult times. Another thing the SEG does is accelerate geophysical innovation, the science of geophysics. This is a huge part of our business operations. It's also our mission, what we do. It takes many forms. Part of its publications, you all see these wonderful publications that uh, come across your desk. We've got the leading edge geophysics interpretation, reference books, SEG ebooks. If you look at the leading edge, this is our general purpose magazine that everybody in the society gets access to, either in print or in an e-copy, and it's the way we communicate our ideas throughout the organization every month. Geophysics is our flagship scientific geophysical journal, and it's been in existence since 1936. It touches every corner of the world. This large uh, list here are papers and how many uh, papers come from each country. And you can just go through there and find that we touch all corners of the world. On the right-hand side, we have the origin of the manuscripts from different kinds of organizations, universities, research institutes. You'll notice oil companies here are represented as 5% of the papers. So the Geophysical Journal is dominated by universities, research institutions, service companies who are developing the science of geophysics predominantly. But we felt a need many years ago that the oil companies who are doing interpretation work were underrepresented in this journal. And so we have a joint journal now with AAPG called Interpretation. And here are the numbers for interpretation. You can see the country distribution is, again, very broad-based. But notice that in the list here, 18% of the papers come from oil companies. So this journal has served its purpose to give us more interaction with the oil companies, which are the sort of the top of the food chain, if you will, of the oil and gas business, so that they could publish their work and also benefit everyone else in the society. We have online everything. Everything is online. You'll see in the next few months a new look and feel of the SEG website, just as you see a new look and feel around you today. This opening ceremony, if you were at the one last year and the year before, this is what it looks like at the IPTC in Kuala Lumpur. This is what it looks like at the EAGE. This is what it looks like at SBE meetings. This is a very modern look. We have Freeman involved. These are all the people around you making this work. And it moves us up to the new level so that we could potentially, for example, next year stream this section, this session around the world so that anybody in the world could see the opening session. One thing that's very interesting online is we have something new, which is a volunteer registry. Here's how you get to it. You do a click here, a click here, and you're in. You give them your details, and you say, I'd like to serve on this and that committee. And we capture that information, push it out. This is Don Steeple's baby. I know he's in the room somewhere. Um, thank you, Don, for pushing this idea, nucleating this idea. So let's give Don a big round of applause for the volunteer registry. Thank you. <clears throat> Another way we reach out scientifically is conferences, events. Too many to list here, but lots of things going on around the world. 
We also had distinguished lecturers. You see them listed here. We have regional lecturers. We have the DISC. We have honorary lecturers. We have a very vigorous program of lectures going around the world to sort of cross-fertilize the entire uh, spectrum of our membership with ideas, new ideas, best practices, reaches into student societies, reaches into local societies, reaches everywhere in the world. E-learning courses are just coming online. You see here an example from Leon Thompson so that someone half a world away could benefit from what Leon knows about elasticity and it ups everybody's game that we can do this. And we are in the process of bringing more of this online. It's a beautiful way to reach people that we would otherwise not be able to reach. I've shown many logos up here, here's some more. I haven't said thank you to any of them, but I say thank you to all of them. If I said thank you every time I had to say thank you in this talk, I would just stand up here and say thank you. But thank you <laughs> for all of the corporate support that we have. And the corporate support, of course, flows through the foundation, and it touches us all. It allows us to have the uh, fine events that you're going to enjoy this week. Um, so anyway, just in case I forget to say thank you to your particular company, consider thanks as given. What about inspiring the next generation of geophysicists? That's also part of what we need to do, and it's part of what we do. Student chapter growth over the last 14, 15 years. You can see the blue lines are outside of the US. Uh, we have growth also within the US. And again, the number now is around 338 student chapters. Distribution around the world, just in a broad sense, shown in this map. We're a tad underrepresented in Southeast uh, Asia in here, and we are working with well-established groups in the area to form affiliated societies so that we can up our game down in that part of the world as well. University and student programs, we have such fantastic programs for students. Many of them are listed here, field camp grants. You talk to some students, the reason they're in geophysics is because they went to an SEG-sponsored field camp, or they got a scholarship to come to this meeting from somewhere very far away and it changes their lives, they take that message back, and it, um, it sets up the next generation. You notice down here it says new, we've got a new program called EPIC, Emerging Professionals International Committee. The idea here is to capture the energy, the momentum of people who are in the uh, early part of their career, which we define as the first eight years. We are all trying to keep, to get students interested, convert them into members, so that they become geophysicists for life and part of the SEG. You see the quote there by Chris Crone, who's our, on our board, that this effort is to promote a sense of belonging and volunteer engagement for early career scientists. A sympathy that all of us have on the board and beyond. One thing you notice in that group of emerging professionals is it's a different kind of SEG member. When we come out of this downturn, which we will, the average SEG member is going to be younger, more global, and more diverse. Part of that is gender. And you see here from a recent article by Eve Sprunt and TLE, if you look at our age demographics and the fraction of women, we have a very large growth in women in the late student years and early career. And the, w, the WNC, the Women's Network Committee, is all over this, doing everything they can to make the SEG an inviting place to those young women who want to have a career in geophysics. We have Student Leadership Symposium sponsored by Chevron. We just had this uh, on Saturday, as I recall. Yes, I was there. Exxon Mobil's student education program. These are fantastic programs that, again, reach out into the student population. Field trip grants, I've already mentioned that. TGS is our prime sponsor on field trip grants. And in, in geophysics and in geology, what gets people hooked and keeps them there for life is the field. 
And that's a very important part of what we do, and this is the way that we support that. And we can always improve what we do in this area as with all others. And again, companies that support very heavily our university and student programs are deeply thanked. Geoscientists Without Borders, most of you are familiar with this program. It touches the whole globe. Every balloon up here is a GWB project. These are the sponsors, and I'll point out the AAPG in the lower left corner. AAPG, through their foundation, is now a partner in Geoscientists Without Borders. This is, this is a small indication of the amount of cooperation that we have between societies. We're in a new era of cooperation with the AAPG, the SPE, the EAGE. It's not a competitive model, it is a cooperative model so that we can better serve our members and our corporate members throughout the world. The near surface community is sort of getting a facelift within the SEG. We established this year a near surface technical section, not a committee. It's a technical section. It's a different kind of animal. It's meant to serve all manner of near surface studies and also to promote publications in this area, joint workshops with other societies, an honorary lecturer in the near surface. And we have a near surface geophysical research fund award, award fund as you can see here, so that we can encourage geophysical research in the near surface and embrace that as an important, important part of the SEG. The SEAM consortium, most of you know about this too, the Advanced Modeling Corporation. Basically, this is a, uh, an attempt over many years to up everyone's game in how we can simulate realistic geology and geophysics, modeling, in order to simulate a realistic wave field. The newest project out there, Life of Field, stored in its infancy, is to basically make a digital oil field that can change through time. As you produce the reservoir, the rock properties change. You can do time-lapse seismic on this thing. It's, uh, it's going to be a fantastic project, and it really is something that no one company could take on. It's only through the umbrella of the SEG forming a consortium of the best companies in the world that can do this kind of work. As we serve uh, people around the world, try to deliver technology that makes a difference to our members, we're working in areas that people in Tulsa and me living in Arkansas know very little about. But we have members in every corner of the world. And we have formed advisory boards to get the best input from these members, what we're doing right, what we can do better, what are the opportunities, how do we hook up with companies and national oil companies in the area to drive our programs forward. The China Advisory Committee has been in existence for several years. And just to give you an indication of the power of an advisory, regional advisory board, we have 1,200 new members in China since 2009, since this board formed. So this, this is huge for us. And this is a very active group driven by some of the best companies, best people in that part of the world. We also have Middle East Advisory Committee that just fantastic in the opportunities that they afford us in terms of joint projects, joint meetings in the area. If something's going on, we hear about it through these advisory boards. So one thing new this year is a Latin American advisory board, really nucleated by Gustavo Carstens here. And this is a new board to really put a holistic view on Mexico on through South America, because the opportunities there are great, and we feel like we can improve what we do in that area immensely if we have the right advice. So the last item on our list is to engage in a sustainable business. The SEG's been in business 85 years. We want it to be in business another 85 years. We have to arrange our affairs so that it is in existence for another 85 years. We inherit the SEG from those who went before us, the Harry Mains and all of these guys. They've handed us a great benefit, a beautiful thing, and it's our job to make it stronger and keep it alive into the future. Most of us have seen this graph somewhere along the way. This is our demographics age on the horizontal axis, histogram count on the vertical axis. 
you look at this curve, you know, some of you interpret it certain ways, everybody's got a different take on it. Let me add a little color here. We've got the student slice over there peeking up. We have the early career group in blue. And I've added these vertical lines so that whoever you are, figure out when you were born, hopefully you know that, and where do you sit? Uh, this is me right here. I am literally over the hill. So <laughs> there you go. So you think, well, we've got a problem here. Really, this demographic bump, I would argue, is a child of that time in 1985, 6, 7. There was an entire generation of geoscientists coming out of school that went into other industries. We had vast layoffs within the industry that we never recovered from, and that is still moving through the system. But we do have an enormous uptake on the young end. We are not alone. This is the AAPG demographic, the SPE demographic. It's just the way it is. We are all interested in this. We are all working to convert student members into functioning early career members so that they become lifetime scientists associated with our societies. But we do not want to compete on this. What we want to do is cooperate. We want to be a tide that raises all ships that as we work to convert people and bring them into the industry, it dovetails with SPE efforts, with AAPG, with EAGE, because we all benefit when these early career people stay in this business. I haven't mentioned the foundation, except I think one small comment, but let me just say right here, the SEG Foundation is a group of volunteers, the foundation board, a group of volunteers which find donors, talk to their friends, talk to everybody, and they get these fantastic donations that come through to support SEG programs. In fact, if you look at the revenue sources for the SEG, number one is the annual meeting, which you're attending this week. Number two is SEG foundation dollars coming to the SEG. The third item are big cooperative conferences. So the foundation is a critical part of the SEG. We often lose sight. We think about SEG, we talk about geoscientists at borders, we talk about scholarships, we don't mention the foundation. Never consider that an intentional oversight. If anyone from my point, my level, says something about scholarships, doesn't mention the foundation, it's an oversight. Because the foundation is absolutely integral to what we do, top to bottom. You see here the foundation board. Uh, if you see any of these people, just please say thank you. They make so much possible for this society. We have corporate sponsors, which give above and beyond the call of duty to support what we're doing. You see them listed here. Now, the idea of collaborative events. This is our third largest revenue stream. Things like the ERTEC, OTC, NAEP. These are cooperative conferences, multidisciplinary conferences, multi-society conferences, and these are front burner with us. Every opportunity we get to team up with the other societies to better serve our members so that, for example, our vendors don't have to go to 20 meetings around the world, they can go to three meetings around the world and hit all the different societies. We are sensitive to that, we, are, we understand that, and we are working in these large cooperative conferences to help make that happen. Part of that also is to bring more geophysical um, content to these big meetings. OTC traditionally has had very little geophysical content, so we have a geophysical board that works to bring geophysical content into it. I would encourage those of you presenting your work to think about presenting the work at OTC, at ERTEC and these other big cooperative conferences. It really helps us to bring more to the table to these big meetings. Finally, along the lines of the sustainable business, we have the new building in Tulsa. Here it is, beautiful picture of the campus in Tulsa. The first building in Tulsa was opened in 1985. We've already talked about that 1985 time frame, very difficult time. The second building was opened uh, this summer. So we have a, a habit of opening buildings during downturns. <laughs> so. But on the other hand, we have a very good uh, 
model out there. The, the building that we built in the 1980s has been a, a constant source of revenue for this society for all those years. The new building will be the same again. And this is prime real estate. We already have over 75% uh, booking into this building. We expect it to be near 90% by the end of this year, six months after opening. And these are not necessarily oil and gas clients. They're banks, they're lawyers, they're a diverse group. It's a different, it's, it spreads our uh, financial risk around. And the real estate board listed here is to be congratulated for working such a complex deal. Again, hug them if you see them. Very important thing here. Quote from Guillaume Cambois, one of our board members. Selecting the executive director is the single most important thing that the SEG board does. I could not agree more. We went through a process of one year going through many, many applications from some of the finest people you can imagine, went through a whole process, and in June of this year, Dorsey Morrow joined us as SEG executive director. He is here. You'll see him all over the place this week. Please take an opportunity to introduce yourself to Dorsey. He comes to our society from a different background, but one that we greatly appreciate. Fantastic management skills, technology background, even legal. And Dorsey is a fine addition to our staff. And he, of course, as the, as the CEO, if you will, um, has a chance then to refocus our entire staff toward what we need to have in these lean times. We have to have everybody pulling the wagon in the same direction and know why they're pulling the wagon. And a lot of that is management, and Dorsey brings that to us. So the last thing I'll talk about is the meeting you stand at today, the SEG meeting, New Orleans, 2015. You might be interested to know that this is the largest technical program in SEG history. You can see the numbers there. Over 900 reviewers. 900, really? How big is that? It's about this big. <laughs> they tell me that picture has 900 people. I tried to count them, I'm not sure. But that's a lot of people. 900 people to review abstracts, to decide, um, to accept, reject, and get them categorized into all the sessions you'll see this week. Um, forget about it takes a village, it takes a small town to do this. Now, the one, last thing I'd like to do before I wrap up is I know that we've got both SEG board members in the room and SEG Foundation board members. Could I have those people stand? Anyone who's on the Foundation board or the SEG board, please stand for a moment. And let's give these people a fantastic round of applause. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The amount of time and effort it takes to sit on the board of the SEG, the thought that goes into it, we have very complex issues, and that's without a, a downdraft of epic proportions. So with that, I will just leave it with you and say that we all have challenges. And I'll just say thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>